Merry Christmas. Did you know it's still Christmas? Often we move on so quickly after the day is done or the couple days with family and we think that Christmas is over. But Christmas continues on until the season of Epiphany begins. And so today is the first Sunday after Christmas. And we're still celebrating the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Or as our text today says, the Lord's Christ. And our reading today takes us to a couple of important rituals that tell us some very important things about the nature of the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. They put us right in the middle of two very important religious rituals that were established. If you want to go back and look in more detail, I'm going to give you kind of an overview today, but in Leviticus chapter 12. But these are holy rituals that the people of God have been doing for thousands of years. Rituals at the temple that have deep meaning that not only connected Mary and Joseph to the people living with them, family and friends of their community, but also with the whole salvation history of God's people. Which is pretty awesome. Yet what's interesting is we look at our text for today, Luke sets up the reading with mention of these rituals, but then the middle part of it, the bulk of the verses, are about two people who interrupt these rituals. They're spirit-orchestrated interruptions. Luke spells that out for us. But it shows us that our God has been working in this way, the same way he works today, all along, both through communal and familiar and reliable rituals that connect us to one another and our history as God's people, but also deeply and powerfully personally by bringing the Holy Spirit of God to each of us individually through his word. So let's start with the rituals, because there's two mentioned here, the purification of Mary and the presentation of Jesus. The purification of Mary was due to uncleanness, ritual uncleanness, not moral uncleanness, with bodily discharge because of the birth of a child, right? And she would be ritually unclean, and, and it's important to note this wasn't, there was no moral good or bad ascribed to this, simply a outpouring of the theology that we have become by nature sinful and unclean. So in order to be ritually clean means to be able to be in the presence of God, to be able to come into his home, we needed to be clean. And we weren't on our own. So um, this was done in, in a way where the, the woman after giving birth would be unclean for seven days and then the child would be circumcised if it was a male, right? So right before this in verse 21, Jesus is circumcised. And then at 40 days, so 33 more days, she would continue in her, the way that it's phrased in Leviticus is blood of purification. And then she would be clean. And in order to finish that process, they would go to the temple and make a sacrifice to atone for the uncleanness, for the sin. Now, we don't have to do this anymore because Christ was the sacrifice once for all, so our uncleanness has been dealt with permanently. But for a long time, God's people did this process through the temple. And the, the sacrifice given was a lamb a male lamb, but if you were unable to afford that, it would be two turtle doves or two pigeons. So from that, we can tell that Mary and Joseph aren't the richest people around. Then you have the presentation of Jesus. The firstborn males among God's people were consecrated or holy or set apart to God. In other words, they were to be given into service to God. Now, this has been done ever since the firstborn males of God were spared by the angel of death in the tenth plague when he was setting them free from Egypt. And so they belonged to God. Right? Now, if you want to think of it in more modern terms, we have a tribe that's set aside as the priests in Levi after they, the exodus from Egypt, and they are the sort of pinch hitters for the rest of the tribes of Israel in this regard. And so what they would do is they would bring their firstborn son to the temple and in order for their firstborn son to not have this lifelong service obligation to God in his temple, there would be a sacrifice made, and the Levites were the priests in the temple. And so that's what's happening here 
with Jesus. Now, of course, we know with Jesus, he's of the tribe of Judah, the tribe of kings, and he is a priest. So by presenting Jesus at the temple, Jesus isn't really getting out of his priestly duties, which is a good thing for us. And in order to make atonement for the son not entering the service of the temple, a sacrifice was made. So both these rituals were done 40 days after the birth of the child, and Jesus is specifically mentioned, and we heard it in our reading today, that he is born under the law. See, this is no mere appearance of humanity, but actually taking on the flesh of humanity and living a human life. And so, just like everyone else born into the people of God, Jesus needed to fulfill the law. And so, his parents brought him to the temple. So, you can see that Jesus is already beginning to fulfill his messianic mission before he's even two months old, subjecting himself to the law of Moses. So, there's a lot of history, and, um, and many, many people have participated in these rituals that we hear about today. Yet, as mentioned before, Luke doesn't spend a whole lot of time dwelling on those, and we immediately move to these spirit-orchestrated interruptions. So Simeon and Anna really come out of nowhere in our text. They're not mentioned elsewhere in the scriptures. We don't know a whole lot about them, so I'm going to read the short descriptions from our reading about who they are, right? And to make it sort of seem part of the, the ritual here, if you wanted to be funny about it, is if any page you look at in your bulletin, we have what are called rubrics, which are the little instructions in the small italics, like sit and stand, or when I say the greeting of peace, like go talk to people and shake their hands and tell them peace, the Lord be with you, all that kind of stuff. There's no rubric for grab a stranger's baby, hold them in the air, and sing, right? That's not part of the ritual present at the temple, yet God is at work in that. And we all know the truth of that, right, that we have these rituals that are of great comfort to us and important to us, but also that God works through His Spirit in other ways that are deeply personal to us. And Luke is highlighting both of those things, the communal and historical rituals of God's people and the personal and powerful activity of the Holy Spirit inside each and every one of us. So first we have Simeon, and here's what it said about him. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And consolation here means comfort of Israel, the comfort of the promise being fulfilled. And he was told by the Holy Spirit that he would see the Lord's Christ before he died. Now, interestingly enough, we always picture Simeon as super old, but the text doesn't actually tell us how old he was. He could have been 35 for all we know, right? But he was promised that he would see the Lord's Christ before he died. And what happens when he sees Jesus? He runs over there, grabs this not even two-month-old baby out of his mother's arms and lifts him up and praises God. And notice that his praises of God are more focused on what Jesus means for the people of God as a whole than for himself. He says, you can now, I can now depart in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. Your Christ is here, the light to the Gentiles, the glory of your people, Israel. Then our second spirit-orchestrated spirit interruption is Anna. And here's what the text says about her. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher. And she was described as a devout, constant presence in the temple who is in prayer and fasting in anticipation for God's fulfillment. And what does she do when she sees Jesus? Same thing. She gives thanks to God and speaks of him to all who are waiting for the redemption of Israel. See, the beauty of today's text is it's very easy for us to see ourselves in it. Like Simeon, Anna, Mary, Joseph, and even baby Jesus, we find ourselves in the midst of God's work through holy communal rituals that tie us to the history of our salvation as God's people. And in the midst of that shared setting, the Holy Spirit comes to us individually and reveals the presence of the Lord's Christ. 
one of the things that you may have heard me say in Bible class here is that sometimes when people are telling me that they enjoyed my sermon, they might tell me they really enjoyed they, that I said something that I'm thinking, I don't think I said that. So either they were daydreaming or the more likely explanation is the Holy Spirit was taking God's word and applying it to them. For he knows the situation of each of our individual lives, just like he did with Simeon and Anna. So what's happening here is that the holy and the human are coming together. And the humanity is being made holy in the person of Jesus. You see, why is Jesus doing all the rituals of the people of God? Because He is, in one person, the people of God. He is the new Israel in one man. And He has come to fulfill God's law and make God's people clean and holy again. All the barriers of the Old Testament to us being in the presence of God, Jesus has come to destroy has come to make irrelevant. The reason that you and I don't travel to a temple when our children reach the age of 40 days is because of Jesus, because our uncleanness has been dealt with. You see, all the laws of Moses present in our text today are centered around this sinful uncleanness that has by nature infected us since the fall into sin. We can't enter into God's presence without experiencing His just judgment, and wrath. But Jesus is here. A sacrifice must be made, and the glorious truth revealed by the Holy Spirit to Simeon and Anna and today to you as well is that the Lord's Christ is here. You can see Him and recognize who He is in the midst of our shared ritual. He is the consolation of Israel, the comfort of God's people, and a light to the Gentiles, a light of God's revelation to those who in Christ now have been grafted in to the people of God. You and me now are connected to all of that salvation history, all of those people of God through Christ. So today when we gather to worship, we share our communal holy rituals. Our rituals are newly established in Christ later, so we're not going to the temple anymore, but they're rituals just the same, rituals given to us by God in order to remember His mighty works of salvation. Right When we get to communion, what are the last, two, what are the last lines of both sections of the words of institution? Do this in remembrance of me. So not only to remember the salvation one and the mighty works of God, but it also is a communal confession of faith together. Yet, just like all those years ago in our shared ritual space, by the grace of God's Holy Spirit, He comes to us each individually. How often have you felt, and I've felt this on the other end as well, that when the readings are being read or the sermon is being preached, you're wondering if that guy was following you around during the week and knew what was going on because it was speaking directly to what you were experiencing. Being on this end, I can tell you we didn't. We're not that good, but the Holy Spirit is. And He uses us to bring God's Word to speak to you on an individual level, to reveal Himself to you. So we share today in the song of Simeon in our church. You probably recognize those words when they were read because you've probably sung them hundreds of times. Lord, now let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. And we're going to sing that later today. That's a shared ritual that binds us together, one that's been sung for a long time. If you turn to page 9 in your bulletin, you'll see it there. Towards the top of page 9, right after the rubric for standing, post-communion canticle called the Nunc Dimittis, which is a Latin phrase that just means, let us now depart. Now, if you open up your hymnal to that page reference, you'll see the scripture reference for those words is our gospel reading today. That's where those words come from. 
because we are like Simeon. God has revealed himself to us in his word so that when Jesus shows up, we can see him and rejoice. So when we sing that later in our service today, I really want you to pay attention to the words. Those are your words, not just Simeon's. Because you have seen Christ. And note where we sing it in the service as well. Simeon sang this song in response to seeing Jesus being brought to the temple. And we sing this song right after we celebrate Holy Communion, where our Lord's very body and blood are brought and given to us. We see Him and rejoice. We're at peace. And so we join with Simeon in singing, Let us now depart in peace. So here today in the midst of our holy communal rituals, God is coming to you in Jesus. And by the grace of his Holy Spirit, like with Simeon and Anna, you can see him for who he is. The Lord's Christ, the consolation of Israel, of which you are now a part. God's mighty work of salvation in the flesh for you. So I want to close with this. I want you to close your eyes. And I'm going to just read the words of the Song of Simeon from our text today. But I want you to imagine that you are the one who's holding Jesus and saying these words. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Jesus is here. The Lord's Christ has come. And by God's Holy Spirit, we see him. In the name of Jesus, amen.